All right, so today we're gonna do Aristotle. We already talked about Socrates and Plato. And just as Plato was the disciple of Socrates, Aristotle was the disciple of Plato. And I can't even imagine what those class sessions must have been like. With Plato, he started a philosophic academy in, in Athens called the Academy, Plato's Academy. And I think the Academy went for over a thousand years before it was shut down, I believe, by Justinian, a Christian emperor who didn't want any paganism being taught in his empire, <laughs> including Platonic thought, which I think is quite interesting. And Aristotle went on to found his own school. I believe he called it the Lyceum. And so we had the Academy and the Lyceum. And we're talking like fourth, fourth fifth century um, BCE in Athens. Historically, this is also the rise of Macedon, Philip of Macedon, whose vision was to consolidate these Greek city-states. Because remember, in the Greek mentality, they weren't thinking of themselves as Greeks per se. I mean, they did have the culture of Hellas or the Hellens, and they spoke a common language. They had very similar culture, very similar religious beliefs, ideas, but they were independent. Each city was like its own state unto itself, the polis. And Philip, coming from Macedon, the country just north of what we see as modern-day Greece, it's modern-day Macedonia, he was like, can you imagine what it would be like if all these city-states were consolidated into one collective, into one nation or one empire? And so that was his vision and goal, and he was able to systematically incorporate, either through negotiation or by force, one city-state after the other until by the time his son came of age, Alexander, we have Greece rising to become the most powerful empire in, in the Western world. In fact, able to even go and invade Persia and Egypt. In fact, Alexander went all the way to the subcontinent of India. But, and I believe Greek philosophy changed quite dramatically after they reached India. And we'll talk about that next week because very different ways of thinking after the subcontinent had been penetrated. And I believe there was an exchange of ideas and you'll see that reflected back in Greek thought for those following Aristotle. Anyways, Philip wanted a tutor for his son and he chose Aristotle. And if you can imagine, Aristotle was like a living human encyclopedia. His first series of works were called the physics, where he studied things like motion and architecture and design and the physical, tangible things of nature. He also studied plants, animals, humans. So he was like a zoologist, a botanist, an anthropologist. And on top of all this, his second series of works was called the metaphysics, where he dealt with things like God, the soul, ethics, morality, logic, reason, how we should live. And so he's quite the package. But like a good disciple, instead of just parroting what his teacher Plato said, he approaches philosophy from actually the opposite perspective of his great teacher. And I got number one with me today for illustration, which is great. So if you remember back to the Platonic forms, Plato believes we have this eternal concept of like mugness in our minds. And when I see physical mugs in the physical material world, because I have this template in my mind, I can recognize this as a mug. And then I can make a value judgment between two mugs, which is a better mug based on this template I have in my mind. Okay. Now, humans, none of us have a perfect template of the ideal forms in our minds, but we can conceptualize them. We can use reason to think about these forms. Unfortunately, most people think that it's the physical material world and like this physical material mug which defines mugness and 
Plato is saying, no, no, we know this is a mug because we already have the idea of a mug. In fact, someone used that idea of a mug in their mind to put clay on a wheel and throw this mug and then glaze it based on a concept they already had in their head. Now, Aristotle is saying, oh, pfft, nonsense. We don't have some like cosmic idea of mugness floating around that penetrates down to all the mugs in the world. And in our textbook, he used the example of a dog. You have this like image of this cosmic form of a dog up here in the sky and then all the little individual dogs down here participate in that dogness. Well, Aristotle is saying, no, first we have to start with the physical material world, the world of sense perception and things. And then if we collect a bunch of animals that are in this like dog type um, category or whatever you want to call it, we can line them up and then we can study them and we can look at what traits are similar to them and unique to them from say like felines or from hominids or from bananas, right? And we can use our reason to make these distinctions. In fact, Aristotle would go so far as to say it is the physical material world that as we engage in it as a rational animal, that was Aristotle's name for humans, we were rational animals, we observe the world and then we take in data and we can use our reason to construct things and make new things. Then from those conceptions we can form universal ideals. So both Plato and Aristotle believed in a realm of universal ideals, they believed in the realm of mind and concepts, and they both believed in a physical material world. So they both have all three of these movements. It's simply Plato is starting from the top coming down and Aristotle is coming from the ground going up. So if you want to look at it as two sides to the same coins, however, Plato, because of his preference, is called the father of idealism. Ideas equal reality. Aristotle is called the father of realism, which I resent as a Platonist because I think ideas are more real. But if you assume the physical material world is primary, you would agree Aristotle is the realist and Plato is the idealist. I prefer to say Aristotle is the materialist or the empiricist, but I don't get to write categories for history. So say you're walking in the, in the field and you see a gourd and the gourd has been dried out and part of it's broken and it has captured some rainwater and you have this like aha eureka moment you're seeing a physical gourd in a physical field with physical rainwater but by looking at its shape and what its function can now be to hold water i can then go back grow a gourd dry it out and shape it to form a cup or a mug or a ladle okay I started with something physical, then I used my ideas, imagination, to think of ways I could adjust that to something I could use as a human. And then after a bunch of people had made different ladles or cups or mugs from gourds, maybe someone else is like, whoa, what if we made the same shape out of clay and we baked it because we know hard clay gets like stone. And then we could have like a vase or a jug or a bowl or a pottery. So does this make sense? And then after we have all of these things, we can use our reason to make categories of cookware or mugness or bowls or however we want to use our reason to define things. But we're starting with the physical material and we're working our way up to the ideal as opposed to Plato. Now he, let me share my screen here real quick. I was able to do a little prep work this time and pull up a couple images. So this first image I want to show you That's not it. There it is. So in this first image so it's very It's very similar to the one we have in our book if it's it might even be the same one from Palmer. Oh it is. After Palmer someone else used it. They gave him credit down there in the left-hand corner. 
And here we have Plato, I mean, Aristotle, talking about different types of causes. And he has four types of causes. So when we come to an object, here we have a block of marble. And so the material cause, the one at the bottom, is what the object is physically made of. The formal cause is the imagination or the reason, the human element being brought into this physical object and what we want it to become. And in this case, he has this formal idea in his head of let's make a statue. Now what changes the block of marble into a statue is the efficient cause. And this is the sculptor who's actually there with a chisel and a hammer and he's flaking away all the stone that is not the image inside the artist or artisan wants. And then the final cause is the end goal of that object, what it was meant for. And in this case, to be an ornament on a temple, maybe for remembrance or a call to worship to one of the Greek gods. Okay, so that's really interesting of how he works this out, but it makes so much sense because if we go back to the um, coffee mug analogy, Plato would look at this and evaluate it based on this concept he has in his mind of the eternal forms. Aristotle is going to look at the physical material mug and he's going to use his senses. He's gonna smell it, he's gonna feel it, he's gonna taste it, look at it. all. All these as I don't know if I can hear my mug. Oh, I can. I can hear the ocean in my mug. But he's going to use his physical senses to make determinations. And so basically, he's going to say, well, it looks like a mug. It feels like a mug. It's functioning as a mug. Therefore, it must be a mug. And, and then if I want to evaluate if it's a good or a bad mug, I'm not basing that off of some template in my mind. I'm basing it on its form and function. How well does it function as a coffee mug? Well, this one functions pretty well because of its design. It's, it's great for, it's a great travel mug because of its shape. When the coffee sloshes around when I'm driving, it, it falls back into the cup because of the narrow opening and the wide base. So great design. But if I had like an insulated metal mug with the lid on it, Aristotle would probably like that even better because now I can drop it. It's going to keep my beverage warm for longer. Um, it's durable and it's really providing a good form and function. Where Plato might be saying, no, that looks nothing like my template of a eternal coffee mug, but the form and function is what wins out for Aristotle. The other thing I want to bring up about Aristotle was he made a distinction between the actual and the potential. And this is a really profound distinction being brought into philosophy. Um, he uses the example of an acorn, how an acorn is a potential oak tree, but it is not an actual oak tree. He's also interested in the end, like what is the end goal of anything we see on earth. For an acorn, it would be to grow into an oak tree, to become mature, to produce its own acorns, and that would complete its cycle. For a human, it would be a boy is a potential man. He becomes actualized when he reaches adulthood, is able to sire his own children and continue and complete that cycle. So. I think it's really important to see this distinction and you can see how important this is going to be in like ethical issues like say abortion. If I ask you, is a zygote a human? Now you could say it's a, it's a human zygote or even I could say a baby, is a zygote a baby? And I would say no, a zygote is a zygote but it has the potentiality to become a baby or a child. Um, let me give you another illustration, maybe something less loaded. If I go to a one of the orange trees in my yard and I see a blossom on the orange tree, I would say that blossom has the potential to become an orange. 
the blossom is not an orange, but if it's left to grow, if it becomes pollinated and gets the resources it needs from the tree, it will develop until it becomes an orange, produces seeds that can then be planted to grow other trees that will blossom, grow into fruit, bear seeds, etc. So you may not like his application for um, issues like abortion or euthanasia, but that's how he's thinking. He's seeing the difference between the potential of a human life, like in the sperm and egg, we could say, or even when those come together in a zygote, it's still very different what's happening at six weeks than what's happening at nine months, and then what's happening at four years and 40 years, 80 years, right, where you become fully actualized as a human. I. It's kind of mean, but the few times I have got freshman classes, I like to look at, at them and say, I see an infinite sea of potential before me. The reason it's mean is because what I'm saying is you are nothing, you have achieved nothing. <laughs> um, a reverse way to say it would be to say something like, God has no potential. Why does God have no potential? because God is fully actualized. There's nothing more God can develop into or be or become because God is fully realized, okay? But he has always been fully realized. There was never a time where he went from actual potential. He is, I mean, to potential to actual, but he has always been fully actualized. All right, the next thing I wanna mention is we have Aristotle's contribution to formal logic in the West. And we'll start with something simple. Let's try this one. And so this is a, a really simple syllogism. And Aristotle, I, I don't know if he invented this. I mean, I imagine this was part of Greek thought or culture, but as far as I know, he gets credit for formally writing these down. And this is a huge part of what comes down to us from the Greeks in the Western tradition and the way we are taught to think in Western cultures. And in this type of logic, you start with a major premise. And so this is a truth claim or a statement you follow it by another premise, and then it can lead you to logical conclusions. Now, a word of warning, just because something is logical does not mean it is true. Okay, so with that qualifier, he starts with the major premise, all men are mortals. The minor premise is all Greeks are men. Therefore, we can logically conclude all Greeks are mortals. Does that make sense? That is a logical conclusion derived from those two premises. Now, we're assuming that those premises are true. If all men are not mortal, then this formula is going to end up with faulty results. Or if all Greeks are not men, that could also lead to faulty results. So what if women are immortal and some Greeks are women? Then not all Greeks would be mortal because all the female Greeks would be immortal. So it would make it a false claim. Um, I, one of the most famous ones is all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So if you accept the premises, then you can find a logical conclusion. But once again, just because the conclusion is logical does not make it true. And in fact, some philosophers had fun playing with this to create paradoxes. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, it's actually mentioned in the Bible, I believe. Um, we have I forget the Cretan's name, but I'll just say Critus the Cretan. Critus the Cretan claims that all Cretans always lie. Okay. The, the reason this is a paradox is because Critus is a Cretan. And if 
all Cretans always lie, it means he's telling the truth about the Cretans, which means all Cretans don't always lie because sometimes they tell the truth, but that means they're liars because, <laughs> and so you get this weird like domino thing going in your head with that sort of paradox. But for most of us, we, are, we have been brought up with this sort of thinking. And what I like to call this is an either or type of logic. And Aristotle called it the law of non-contradiction, where something cannot be both one thing and another thing simultaneously. It either is something or it's not. It's either black or it's white. It's right or it's wrong. It's high or it's low. It's good or it's evil. And this is the way we have been brought up to think with this law of non-contradiction in the West. And you see people use this in logical arguments all the time. Because if you just have two choices, if you can disprove the other person's point of view, like we saw in the argument ad absurdum of Zeno defending Parmenides, then by default, the other proposition should be correct. If there's only a choice A or not A. In addition to the law of non-contradiction, Aristotle also promoted what's called the correspondence theory of truth. And what the correspondence theory of truth is saying is that when we make a truth claim, it needs to correspond to reality. Now, what Aristotle means by reality is the physical material world. So if I say my mug is in my hand, that is a false statement because it does not correspond to physical reality. If I now say my mug is in my hand, that is a true truth claim because my words, my statement corresponds with physical material reality. So do you guys have those two down? Those are gonna become really important later on when other philosophers are like, that's helpful non-contradiction and correspondence theory of truth. But what about when we start dealing with certain topics where both answers are going to be problematic? Um, so let me give you an example from Christian theology. Is Jesus a God or a man? Do you see the problem? Right. This does not allow for both because you cannot be simultaneously a God and a man. You're either a God or a man. You're either immortal or you're mortal. So how do we deal and reconcile with Jesus in an Aristotelian type logic? And what people ended up doing is they would either say he is fully God and they would deny his humanity or they would embrace his humanity and deny his divinity. And both of those are heretical teachings in the church. Because like Christina said, he is both. He is a God-man. He's not a demigod like Hercules. He's not 50-50, but he's 100% God, all God, but he's also all man simultaneously. That's orthodox theology. Aristotelian logic does not help us with that it also begins to break down once we get to quantum physics and mechanics because we have light being acting as both a particle and a wave simultaneously. And apparently it depends whether or not the light is being observed or not, whether it comes through in particles or waves. <laughs> That's a problem. Later, when we get to the eighth century, we'll have other philosophers weigh in and offer a different solution to this either or type thinking. Now, don't get me wrong. This is super valuable and it's helpful to have a nice formal logic and reason so you're not contradicting yourself, you're not speaking out of both sides of your mouth, but you're being clear and consistent in what you're saying. It's also helpful, like if I come home and I slip on the skateboard on the front steps and I want to ask my family who left the skateboard on the steps. I want a yes or no, I did it uncle, or a black and white, no I did not do it answer from my family. 
I don't want some, well, who can really say what is a skateboard or what do you mean by left? Or I don't want any of that. I'm asking for a very black and white, yes or no, right or wrong answer. And for a lot of our use of logic and reason, that's very appropriate and helpful. I just want to warn you when you get to certain abstract concepts or principles, this falls pathetically short, it, to put it mildly. Okay, so we've covered his epistemology, where we get knowledge, sense experience, we think about it, we universalize it, we talked about his logic, we talked about his um, potentiality and actuality. Um, let's talk just a little bit about his ethics because I love it so much. Um, I cover him as one of my nine Western theories when you take ethics with me, if you haven't taken it yet, but I'll give you like a little sampler right now. Um, in his ethics writing, Aristotle believed that reason or knowledge is good and ignorance is evil. This is the same thing we saw Socrates teaching and Plato. So I think this was part of the Greek presupposition. So knowledge is good, ignorance is evil. And Aristotle believed you could actually habituate good behavior, just like we have bad habits that we should try to avoid, we can have good habits that we foster. And so he saw ethics or living a right moral life as someone that habituated right ways of living. And since he believed knowledge was good and ignorance was evil, the way to deal with evil behavior in ourselves or in others or in society was to educate them. In fact, Aristotle went so far as to say no one does evil through knowledge. When people do something evil, it's always done out of ignorance. Any thoughts on that statement? It's quite a statement. So whenever we do something wrong, it's out of ignorance because if we would have known better, we would have done something better. He, what he, about, go ahead. I was gonna say, what about when you intentionally choose what's wrong? He, he would say, if you really understood what you were doing, you wouldn't have made that choice. You're choosing what's wrong because you're ignorant, either of the consequences or the ramifications or any of that. See, this is a non-falsifiable statement, which is a philosophic fallacy, as if you study more into formal logic. And because basically no example any of you could give me will work because all I have to say, well, if you really, really knew, you wouldn't have done it. So there's no example you can give me. He has a very high view of humans and of what we can gain through knowledge and education. And those who have bought into this presupposition and even in our own culture and society here in America in the 21st century believe that People are racist because they're ignorant. So if we could simply teach, educate them, we could end education. People are poor because they're ignorant. If we could simply educate them, we could end poverty. People abuse drug and alcohols and their partners because they're ignorant. So if we could just educate people about drugs and alcohols and so domestic abuse, we could end those problems in our society. Um, very different from a biblical approach, certainly, which has a very low, fallen view of man. The Greeks, remember, this is the home of secular humanism. Man is the measure of all things, Protagoras. And even though Plato and Aristotle both believed in a non-anthropomorphic god, high god, um, they had a very high view of human beings. All right. Along with this belief that knowledge is good, ignorance is evil, he, there is this Greek term called erte, E-R-T-E, -E, and it's got a dash over the last E. And erte means excellence. And I like to think of this almost like the, a Bill and Ted's ethic, where if you saw Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, their little motto would be like, be excellent to one another. Be excellent in all that you do. And that's what Aristotle is saying. 
whether you're a ditch digger or a philosopher, you need to be excellent in what you do. Be excellent in all things. And this is even biblical, right? When you think about he who is faithful in little things will be given greater things or greater responsibility. And so it's this idea, no matter what your task, do it well, do it excellent. And the sum total of all your little excellent deeds will result in an excellent life. Now, Aristotle believed the end goal of ethics and morality, or even life itself, was human flourishing or happiness. And his word for this was eudaimonia. And eudaimonia isn't like yuppie happiness. It's not circumstantial happiness because... I don't know, you got a new car or you got a raise or someone told you you smelled good or whatever. It's not that sort of happiness. Eudaimonia is a deep abiding contentment where you're living a well-balanced and well-proportioned life. And the way you achieve this well-balanced and proportioned life, according to Aristotle, is to be knowledgeable, be excellent in all that you do, and then avoid extremes. And there's two extremes he mentions, the extreme of excess and the extreme of deficiency. I don't need to share this anymore. So in these excesses of extremes and deficiency, we could do this like a continuum. And what I like about this is you could use it either as an individual we could use it collectively as a class or as a nation or as the world. And so we can take any concept and he uses the example of fear. So if we take fear and then we ask ourselves, what would an excess of fear look like? What would we call someone who has excessive fear in our society? Anybody? Scaredy cat. Scaredy cat, coward. That's someone who has too much fear. It's incapacitating them, it's hurting them and their well being. What do we call someone that has no fear in our society? Hero, brave. No. An idiot. An idiot. Foolish, foolhardy, right? People who don't realize they should be fearful because they could die, that's foolishness. What Aristotle is saying, avoid being a coward, paralyzed by fool, and avoid the mistake of having no fear, which could jeopardize yourself and others, and find that golden mean, that balance, that well-proportioned life between cowardice and foolhardiness. And he would call the golden mean between the two courage. Because a courageous person is someone who understands why they should be afraid, but they act in spite of their fear. Okay. And you can do this with anything. And so what Aristotle wants us to do isn't to find the middle of the road. He's not saying be lukewarm or a fence straddler, but he's saying avoid excess and efficiency and find that well-balanced place that works for you and your life. So let me give you a battlefield example. Remember Achilles, the invincible, because the gods dipped him, they were holding him by his ankle and dipped him into invincibility. Well, for Achilles, he could be way more on the fearless end of the spectrum without it being foolish for him because he has nothing to fear. But to be wise and well-balanced, he should put like a little buckler or shield behind his Achilles tendon, because that's his one weakness. That would have been living a well-balanced life for Achilles. Now, say this person over on the other end of the spectrum that's born very timid, a personality, they jump at their own shadow, but they want to also be brave or courageous. Well, for them, maybe they have to take a stake and a chain out to the battlefield and actually physically stake themselves down so they won't run away and they'll be there to defend their city or their values or their family. That might be a well-balanced life for that person. 
most of us are going to be somewhere in between those two extremes of Achilles and the person born timid. And we'll find our balance somewhere in between. And even societies and cultures have used this to kind of deal. We have this in our own country between the left and the right, between Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and progressives. In the middle, we try to find a balance to keep equilibrium and harmony in our society instead of just letting the left or the right take us to wherever they want us to go. And so we do see that sort of element there in, in society, kind of like applied ethics. All right. Any other questions on that? That was just like the little nutshell version, and you'll get the full, full thing when you take ethics with me. All right, well, the last thing I want to talk to you about is Aristotle's proofs for the theory of God. And even though he was a pagan Greek philosopher, when we get to the 12th and 13th century with Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic theologian, he actually kind of like baptized Aristotle into the faith and used his logical rational arguments and his proofs for the existence of God to prove the Christian God. And let me show you how some of these work and, and why they're compatible. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll give you three different types of, of argument um, that Aristotle is using. Actually, let me see if I can find um, real quick. Now I'm just gonna go with Aristotle's not what Aquinas did to it. We'll get to that later when we get to Aquinas in class. Um, it's interesting because St. Augustine, who lived 800 years before Aquinas, holy cow, that's amazing, um, in like the fourth, fifth century AD, he did the same thing with Plato. He kind of like baptized Plato into the Christian faith and then incorporated Platonic philosophy and blended it with Christian theology. And that's what we had throughout the Middle Ages. Well, when the lost works of Aristotle were found during the medieval period after the fall of Rome, uh, much of the literature and ancient works that had been produced in the West had been lost, especially when Islam came in and conquered much of the Mediterranean region. Well, after the Crusades, much of these writings had been rediscovered, including the lost works of Aristotle, lost to the West they had been preserved by Islam, translated into Arabic with commentary, and so then they were retranslated into Latin. So the Greek into Arabic into the Latin, and then we regain that knowledge. And this is part of what brought about the Renaissance in Western culture was the rediscovery of the lost works of Aristotle. We had his logic, his syllogism, but we lost a lot of these other aspects. Anyways, his proofs for the existence of God. The first has to do with motion. And if you guys are familiar with the term inertia, objects at rest tend to stay at rest, objects in motion tend to stay at, in motion unless they meet an object of equal or greater force. I think that's the one I memorized in elementary school or middle mm -hmm. school, whatever. So. <laughs> this idea is if we see something in movement, it implies or infers a mover. Something had to get that thing moving. So if, I don't know, if you see, if you see me throwing this object back and forth, you can pause and say, what is causing this object to move? And you can say, well, Fred is. But then I have to ask, well, what's causing Fred to move? And you say, well, I guess your parents did. What well, caused my parents to move? And you keep going back and back and back. I'll never forget when I did this the first time with my parents. I was probably five years old. And it was this causality game we were playing. And this idea that everything has a cause and effect. And so I got them, because I was raised Baptist fundamentalist, I got them to take me all the way back to Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden in this where did I come from game or what caused me game. And it got pretty interesting when we got to Eve, right? Because Adam and Eve didn't come from parents like the rest of us. She came from the biblical account from the rib of Adam. But that was still okay in my little child mind. There was still cause and effect. And then Adam was even weirder 
in that he came from the dust of the ground. But then when I ask, well, where did God come from who made Adam and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? My parents said, oh, God didn't come from anywhere. God always was. And I still remember the duress and pain that caused me as a young child because now my cause and effect chain had stopped and it ended with God. But this is Aristotle, one of Aristotle's proofs for God, that it can either be from, from motion or from causality. And it works both ways. Where, And he calls God the uncaused cause or the unmoved mover. And th that's beautiful. I love this way of thinking. So we are not talking about Zeus or Hera or Athena. This is a very non-anthropomorphic deity that Aristotle is talking about and providing a proof for. And basically, God is the original domino flicker. So if all human history or the history of the world was a string of dominoes laid out, God is the one that flicks the first one and gets everything moving. And all movement can be traced back to God. God is the one that starts all things. Now, other things about Aristotle were much harder for Aquinas to reconcile. Now, the proofs for God worked well, the cause from movement, um, the cause from um, causation, cause and effect. The other had to do, however, with this idea, Aristotle believed matter was eternal just like the um, monistic materialist or the pluralist we had in the pre-Socratics. Now, he didn't believe it was any particular thing or particle or atom, but he believed there was like this eternal primal stuff. So it's not any particular thing, but all the physical material things we see in the world came from this eternal primal stuff. As you can imagine, this creates a problem trying to reconcile him with Christian theology when we get to Aquinas in the 13th century. But I'll save that reconciliation for later, because Aquinas was also a brilliant theologian philosopher and was able somehow to make that a Christian idea, even though the scripture tells us God created the world from nothing except his own will and his spoken word. And that's how the physical material world came into existence. Anyone want, want to take a guess at how Aquinas is going to reconcile Aristotle with Christian theology? How do you have one teaching that matter is eternal, but the scriptures teaching that matter came into existence in a certain place and time? God is eternal, so matter and God came somehow at the same time? I don't you're, know. You're right there, Christina, but just a little more nuanced. That was really good. Anyone else want to fill that out? She's on the right track. But we don't want to have matter juxtaposed against God, because then remember what that does. Also, isn't God, God technically man matter? Because he's a physical being of no. sorts? That would be heresy, <laughs> or that would be pantheism, where God and nature are synonyms. But that's well, but God is a being, so technically he's matter. No, he's spirit. The scripture is quite clear. God is spirit. I know he's spirit. But he's still a type of being. He has right, skin. Because, because he, you're it's being. Crea we are created in his image, so if we have the same parts. We must have the same parts he does. So he is matter. Okay, Christina, I'm going to work you a little. So try not to let your head explode. Are you Do I sound crazy? Are you suggesting God is a hermaphrodite? Uh, because you said we're made in his image. Male and female created he them. Do you see the problem? If we're talking physical image? Do you think God has a big gray beard and, and blue eyes and, and balding on top? Do you think God has births? I creation? think he has a human face, yes. That's a guess from my, of me, but. 
you know, those are all anthropomorphisms where we're giving human characteristics or traits to God. Now, we're not talking about Jesus, who is God incarnate, God becoming a man in the flesh. Now, there we say uh, he absolutely has a physical human body. He is the God-man. He is God in spirit who has taken on human form. But when we talk about God, we talk about God as spirit. And that is one of the reasons the Jews were not to represent him in art or sculpture or icons is because God was spirit and God did not want to be made in the likeness of beast or creeping things or mortal man. He wanted us to remember he was in spirit. Now God could manifest. I believe though that he has a, a form. He can change form. So like we and we have need examples him day, we in the Bible. In form, even though he's still a spiritual being. Okay. And those we would call theophanies. When God manifested in physical form in the Bible, for example, a pillar of fire or a pillar of smoke, that's like a physical manifestation of the presence or spirit of God. But God himself is spirit and is not bound or contained by human form. That's, that's orthodoxy. So what that tells me, and I know we're kind of deviating from Aristotle here a little bit, but that's okay. What that's telling me is if we're made in the image of God, it's not talking about our physical bodies. It's talking about the non-tangible parts of us, like our soul, our mind, our reason, our emotions, that we can well, feel Well, our love. souls, of course, are spirit beings, but that's different. Just like our heavenly bodies, that the second body we get when, when we pass away and go enter heaven will also be spiritual. Right. Well, the scriptures tell us we'll have a glorified body. We're not just meant to be disembodied beings. But when you start to attribute a body to God, it becomes problematic, especially with him being omnipresent. Because if God was a physical being, it means he's everywhere all the time if he's omnipresent. And if he had a physical body, that wouldn't leave a lot of room for the rest of us. Okay, then how did he, how, what, what form do you say he appeared to Adam and Eve? Was he just some like ghosts floating around in the garden? No, I think there was some sort of form because they could sense his presence. And I think it even implies they heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's why I believe he has sort of a personal form or that he can change. That's right. just what I believe. I'm not sure though. Okay. So how do we reconcile matter being eternal and God being eternal at the same time from a Christian perspective. For the pagan Greeks, it's not a problem because Aristotle just has God here in this category and matter over here in this category. Nobody? Okay, I'll give it to you. Aquinas dealt with this by saying because matter was eternally in the mind of God, that God has always thought of the physical material world, which means the physical material world has always existed, at least in a sense. But now he's talking like a Platonist, not an Aristotelian, because Aristotle is definitely talking about the physical material world. All right, I think that's, that's yeah, go ahead. That, that would only be true um, because God is omnipresent. Yes. God is omnipresent. But Aquinas also wanted to be faithful to the scriptures, which talks about God specially creating the world out of nothing. So that's how he tried to put the two together. And we'll revisit it again when we get to the 13th century, but we're a ways off. Okay. Um, last little comments on Aristotle. Brilliant mind has had major impact between him and his teacher, Plato. They've just put a rift right down the middle of philosophy. And different ones, one of their philosophies have dominated from time to time. Like I mentioned, from roughly 500 to 1,000, Plato dominated in Western thought um, with the coming of 
the Renaissance and the Reformation, Aristotelian thought began to dominate, which led us to the age of reason and the enlightenment. But now I think as we're coming to like kind of a postmodern era, we're seeing a resurgence of Platonic idealism. And we're, I think in history, wherever you see Platonic idealism and Aristotelian realism kind of crossing over each other and passing sort of, that is when you have these height of human achievement. So for example, when they lived together in Athens, it was the golden age of Athenian art, architecture, philosophy, um, sculpture, paintings, art, because you had these ideals, but also the practical physicality to bring them into the physical material world. Um, the next big convergence we have is towards the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. We have Platonic idealism and Aristotelianism, realism crossing again. And I personally find the art of the high Gothic, the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance as some of the most amazing art in the world. We had rediscovered some of the techniques of the Romans, um, along with like the flying buttresses, once again, this platonic idealism mixed with Aristotelian realism, and those two together produce like Gothic cathedrals, and then later Renaissance and Baroque art. And then I believe we're in that period again, as we're coming out of kind of like this age of enlightenment reason, and you see people with an awakened interest in spirituality and idealism and mysticism, and we have this convergence in this postmodern era where you see all this development in like technology and art and music and culture and style and design. And I think we are all fortunate to be living in the time in which we are living. Plato and Aristotle um, alone are profound. When you put them together, it can bring human thinking and and culture into unprecedented heights. So I hope you enjoyed that talk on Aristotle. We're gonna pick up, oh, one more thing. <laughs> I already said one more thing twice. Aristotle was a bit of an elitist like Plato and very ethnocentric. Um, Alexander, his student, was much more progressive and egalitarian in his thinking. I mean, he was still king and he thought he should be declared a god and all that, but he, he was all for um, bringing Greek culture to other parts of the world, but instead of just conquering them and subjugating them, he believed we should incorporate other cultures into our own cultures, their thinking, their beliefs. We should intermarry with their people. We should become this homogenous culture. He was trying to bring this Hellenized vision of the world. And that was actually the world that Jesus was born into. It was a world that had been Hellenized, civilized by the Greeks, but instead of destroying the other cultures, they incorporated them into their own. And I really thought that is fascinating about Alexander because Aristotle saw the Greeks as the only civilized people, and the further away you got from Greek culture and language and ideals, the more barbaric, uncivilized, and potentially even savage he viewed you. So it radiated out from Greece as the light of the world, and then the further away you got from it culturally and in intellectually, the more barbaric they saw you. So that is like the definition of ethnocentrism. And that was definitely a flaw I would see in Aristotle's brilliant mind. All right, we'll pick up with what happens after Alexander goes to India and philosophy changes quite radically when we pick up next time. And we'll be talking about the Hellenistic philosophers, primarily the Stoics and the Epicureans.